Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Clean Energy View Radio Show. Our podcasts are available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.cleanenergyview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, or contact me directly at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at info at cleanenergyview.com. Today my guest is John Elkington, and we're going to be talking about his book, The Zero Knots, Breaking the Sustainability Barrier. A world of 9 billion people by mid-century will demand fundamental changes in our mindsets, behaviors, cultures, and overarching paradigms. Just as our species broke the sound barrier during the 1940s and 1950s, a new breed of innovator, entrepreneur, and investor is lining up to break the sustainability barrier. In his best-selling book, John Elkington introduces the Xeronauts, a new breed of innovator determined to drive problems such as carbon, waste, toxics, and poverty to zero, as well as creating the first Xeronaut role of honor, spotlighting 50 pioneers in the field of zero. Zero knots are innovating in an astonishing range of areas, tackling huge, diverse economic, social, environmental, and governance challenges. To give a sense of progress to date, we zero in on five key challenges, otherwise known as the five Ps, population growth, pandemics, poverty, pollution, and proliferation. The power of zero has been trumpeted, notably in relation to zero defects. This book spotlights key lessons learned in the field of total quality management and introduces five-stage pathways to zero model, running through from the eureka discovery moment to the point where a new way of doing things becomes endemic in the economy. In order to move from incremental to transformative change, we must embrace wider framings, deeper insights, higher targets, and longer timescales. Xeronauts investigates some ways in which leading Xeronauts are pushing change in relevant directions, with cases drawn from a spectrum of human activity, from water prolificity to human general mutilation. If we learn from these pioneers, the 21st century could be our best just yet. So on today's show, I have my special guest host, Mr. Luis Mejia, who is the managing partner at Murdoch Capital Partners, and we are going to be welcoming Mr. John Elkington and talk about the Xeronauts. So I would like to welcome first my special guest host, Luis Mejia, and then introduce John Elkington. Good afternoon, Thank gentlemen. You. Thanks, June. Uh, this is uh, Luis Mejia. I'm happy to be uh, part of the show. And hello, June. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here, too. John, can you please tell our audience about yourself, and especially about your childhood, what it was like growing up? Uh, Well, there's a big uh, question. I mean, I I, uh, grew up in different parts of the world, um, England, Northern Ireland, Cyprus, Israel. And um, so we traveled a great deal. My father was in uh, the Air Force, so I saw quite a lot of different cultures at a relatively early uh, age. But really, I, I, I think I was incredibly lucky to be born in 1949, and then to grow up uh, from the uh, early 60s onwards with the uh, environmental movement. Thank you. In regards to this book, why did you decide to use the theme of zero knots? Um, a couple of years back, um, Accenture, the consultancy, did a project for um, the uh, UN Global Compact, and the report was the final report was called "A New Era of Sustainability." And, and, and for that project, they interviewed uh, 766 CEOs around uh, the world. And um, what was really striking was that. Um, 93% of those CEOs said that they now think that the uh, what, what, what was called for the study, the sustainability agenda, was really important for their businesses uh, in the future. 88% said uh, this now needs to be driven through their supply chains. All of that was music to my ears, particularly having set up a company 25 years ago called Sustainability. But the, the, the third conclusion was that 81% of those CEOs thought they had already embedded uh, sustainability in their businesses. And and, and to your question, um, something in my brain 
uh, broke at that moment because what I think those people meant, I don't think they were lying, but what I think they meant was that they were doing annual um, uh, sustainability reports. They might even have a chief sustainability officer, but very few, if any of them, I suspect, were thinking about systemic changes. They were thinking about citizenship. They were thinking about responsibility, these sorts of things, but uh, not about the systemic nature of the crises that we face. So the, 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 the reason for picking zero was simply that um, I felt we needed to challenge that type of thinking and, and just basically make the point that a world of 9 to 10 billion people is going to be excruciatingly different uh, from what we've uh, grown up with. And unless we can radically reduce our, for example, environmental footprints, uh, the sorts of lifestyles that we've grown used to simply won't be uh, possible. So just finally, I, I, in, in Zen Buddhism, they have uh, what are called koans, or sort of uh, um, uh, word uh, games, which, which, which shock the human brain into thinking rather differently. And the idea of going to zero and in anything seems for most people impossible. So this is an attempt to sort of just um, provide people with a, a slight provocation, including those 766 uh, CEOs. Now, speaking of CEOs, it's quite interesting. You wrote when you asked the question to the CEOs in regards to the company's product to not product ratio for enterprise, what were the general responses? Well, um, uh, that wasn't us who asked that question. That was a, um, a survey that we reported again. But um, the, the people were very confused. I mean, they, they, they should have known. Um, that the answer to that question, but typically uh, they didn't. And in regards to the whole concept of sustainability, it's a word that a lot of people use. I'm just curious, could you please give us your definition of sustainability and how you'd like, especially for this audience today, how they should keep that definition in mind moving forward? Well, uh, to, to be fair, there, there, there are uh, multiple definitions, but uh, 15 years ago, actually, no, in 1994, so uh, further afield than that, I came up with what I call the triple bottom line, and that was an attempt to make business sense of the sustainability agenda that had been introduced by the Brundtland, Brundtland Commission report in, in 1987. And um, the idea of the triple bottom line was that there was an economic, not just financial, um, uh, uh, aspect or dimension to value creation, but in addition, there were uh, environmental and social uh, dimensions as well. And, and when that uh, notion first went out there, there was a, a bit of surprise. But then others came up with uh, the double bottom line and, and, and various other formulations. And I think now people do accept that the traditional, conventional bottom line is a, is a fairly narrow set of. Uh, measures and fails to capture some really significant aspects of what uh, business does. So, in fact, my um, next book, which uh, will be with the chairman of Puma, the um, sportswear uh, company, looks at how the bottom line will have to evolve uh, in the future. And, 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 and you may be aware that um, Puma, with uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers and uh, Truecost, developed what they call the environmental profit and loss. Uh, accounting uh, method, and, and, and they're the first company to have looked right through their supply chain and tried to put a number, a value, on their environmental footprint. And in 2010, which was the first year that they came up with such a number, uh, the value of their uh, negative uh, uh, environmental footprint was 145 million uh, euros, or, or you could say dollars. So that was about half of their profits uh, that year. So. I, I think sustainability um, is fundamentally about how you uh, house, clothe, uh, fuel, uh, educate um, a world of 9 to 10 billion people sometime later this century without collapsing the biosphere uh, in the process. Why is this no longer about incremental change and how can we create systemic change? Well, I think I, I, I don't for a moment wish to um, sideline those people who are trying to drive 
uh, incremental change. Much of the work that we do is with mm-hmm. entrepreneurs within si- inside major companies. And if, if you stand back at the end of the year, I mean, if, if they've made a one percent improvement in performance, you know, they, they would consider that uh, uh, remarkable progress. Um, but what we're basically saying, and, and, and it's in the book, there are three scenarios there, and, and, and one is a world of breakdown where we, we try uh, in various ways to um, uh, turn the corner uh, on, on some of these big problems, but for whatever reason fail. And if you look at what's going on in Greece and southern Europe on the financial side at the moment, um, if you look at the uh, collapse of many oceanic fisheries, there, there, there are a variety of um, areas where you can see very clear signs of breakdown in t- today's world. Um, in the middle, the second scenario uh, is dubbed or uh, called um, change as usual. And I have nothing against socially responsible investment. I'm, I've, over 20 years, I've served on the boards or advisory boards of six or seven uh, SRI funds, and I, I continue to serve that sort of role today. And I have nothing against corporate social responsibility. I think a, a lot of what happens in that field. Uh, is 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 worthy and valuable, but if you add all of that stuff yeah. up, it doesn't um, represent a set of solutions to the basic systemic dysfunctions that we uh, currently face. And so the third scenario is breakthrough. It's it's how how do you get to the point where you break through the sustainability barrier, which for many of us. Breakable. I mean, the same way that uh, the reason why I refer out to the sound barrier is if you go back to the late 1940s, many people thought uh, the sound barrier uh, well, I didn't know really what it was, but it was a physical uh, impossibility to break through. And then Chuck Yeager and a bunch of other people broke through. And we got a, the Olympics at the moment uh, in, in, in London, obviously. And in 1954, um, a runner, Roger Bannister, broke the four minute. Mile and up until that point, many people considered uh, that to be a physiological barrier. There was no way that you could physically get through. And then, then within a very short period, uh, something like 16 runners went through. So what that I think for me demonstrates is that many of these problems are actually in our heads, in our brains, uh, and that's really where we've uh, got to focus, um, not just on technologies, not just on economics, but on how we think. How does our economic model need to evolve in order to address the nature and scale of the challenges that we face collectively as a society? <laughs> well, um, a couple of evenings ago, I was at the uh, University of Oxford, and I was um, speaking uh, to something like 35 uh, business uh, economists, and I started the uh, lecture by saying that, um, unfortunately, in 1968, I had been doing uh, economics at university, and I gave it up after one year. And the reason was it seemed, at least as I was then being taught uh, the discipline, it seemed to have very little to do with what was going on in the world mm-hmm. socially, politically, environmentally, and so on. Um, and I quoted, just simply to sort of wake the audience up, uh, Hazel Henderson to the effect that current econ- economics is almost a form of brain damage. But then I very quickly went on to say that Economics is vital, and and I think that what is happening is that we're working out new ways of valuing different aspects of the the biosphere. And there have been two very big studies recently, one by um, uh, Nick Stern on the uh, economics of climate change, where he, this is a, a report for the UK government a couple of years back, where he basically said climate change is developing into our biggest market failure ever and then gave um, very cogent uh, ideas on how we might address that. Um, And the second study, um, called the Economics of uh, Ecosystems and Biodiversity, uh, a UN study, but led by Pavan Sukhdev, who was the managing director of Deutsche Bank, again, looking at uh, um, uh, the the field of economics and how it's going to have to evolve in the next sort of 15 uh, or 20 years, and starting to look at areas like ecosystem services. If you look, for example, at Amazonia, a lot of people have been saying, no, don't cut down the rainforest. But what the, um, uh, the sort of teeb style economists are doing is saying, if you look at Amazonia, it is a massive water pump. Uh, if you're a farmer in Argentina, much of the precipitation, the rain that you rely on, comes from Amazonia. Cut down uh, the, uh, more of those trees and you risk 
not being able to farm uh, in Argentina. So I think ec economics and economists are adapting to the new era. But my point a couple of evenings ago is that they haven't been outspoken enough, uh, most of that discipline. Uh, and, and in some ways, the challenges are, headed, uh, are accelerating considerably ahead of their capacity to uh, respond. Do you think that, especially with some of these issues with nature, that especially with how human behavior seems to, or how human seems to, human beings seem to behave, uh, just uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word here. Yeah. Um, do you think that we have to get to a point in society where it's almost too late before they start recognizing that, okay, this is a bad idea, we need to find another way that is not necessarily going to force us to live in a cave, but enable us to exist as we currently are, but just find a more responsible way of doing it? Um, the simple answer is, uh, unfortunately, yes. I think there's something about uh, the nature of the way we as a species think, which means that we're relatively short-term focused. We're pretty parochial in the way that mm. we uh, think. And, and until, I mean, you know, it's often said that if if a, a threat comes at us like a sort of a raging bull, um, w we tend to see it. If it creeps up on us over years or even decades, we tend to be uh, sublimely uh, 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 ignorant of it until uh, it's too late, and I think that's true as true of you know wars like the First or Second World War. I mean, mm -hmm. some people saw that those, those conflicts coming a long time before, but most people were either unaware or chose to ignore the threat until um, it, 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 it thrust itself um, uh, upon them. And I, I, I actually think that. Um, we ha are in the processes of going beyond some thresholds. And eco ecologists have talked this, about this for a very long uh, time. But um, I think if you look at the, the uh, droughts, if you look at the f uh, f fires, if you look mm. at the floods in different parts of the world, and that's Russia, that's India, that's uh, the United States, um, I think that, that you're beginning to see an acceleration in the evidence that something in our global uh, climatic system uh, is shifting. And I'm very uneasily beginning to feel that the United States may, I mean, it's not just the one year of uh, poor harvests with the corn crop. I think we may be beginning to see the early evidence of uh, a dust bowl uh, in the United States again. Uh, and we remember quite what happened uh, with that last time around. How do different cities compare in terms of their natural resources uh, and environmental impact, and what can we do to make them more sustainable? Well, that would have been a, a harder uh, question to answer a few years back, but now you have a growing number of organizations which are addressing the question of how you measure mm. uh, the environmental footprint and the, 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 the natural resource dependencies of it might be cities, it might be uh, states or regions, or it might be uh, countries. And, and, and one example would be the Global Footprint Network, which um, I, do, I think does amazingly good work in, 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 in trying to get a sense of the, um, the dependence of, of, of different parts of our global economy on different aspects of the, the biosphere. That hasn't yet got to the point where routinely uh, national governments talk about uh, their resource take or resource dependency or what they're doing to address uh, those sorts of challenges. But, but the Global Footprint Network is, for example, now working in areas like um, uh, sovereign debt uh, and looking at uh, bond um, uh, markets and beginning to think about how you, over time, would factor some of these issues into uh, those sorts of areas of the, 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 the financial markets. So I think I think in five or ten years, some of this stuff will be clearer to people. It doesn't mean it will be solved or, or, or addressed at the 100% level, but people will be much more conscious about some of these uh, areas uh, than they were before. And just finally, I think you've got uh, a growing number of city mayors around the world. You've got uh, institutions like um, the C40 grouping of uh, cities under the Clinton uh, Global 
initiative, and I think that's over 50 cities. Now you've got cities like your own of, of, of New York, uh, which are doing some really quite spectacular stuff in this, this space. And I think all of that creates peer-to-peer uh, pressure, but also to some degree almost a, a, a process of uh, empowerment. So I'm, I'm actually quite upbeat about the capacity of cities to move in the right direction here. Thank you. Now let's talk about clean tech and the missing link being the connection to consumers. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about clean tech and how do you see it impacting our society? Um, well, 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 several things in a way. I mean, I, in the late 1980s, we did a book called The Green Consumer Guide, and, 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 and that sold a million copies in 18 months, went into 20 foreign editions or, or non-English language uh, editions. And I think what that showed at the time was that, first, that we caught a wave, but, the, but that consumers uh, in different parts of the world were increasingly agitated or concerned about issues like ozone depletion and wanted to do something to address uh, those sorts of issues didn't simply want to subcontract their consciences to NGOs and, and and so on. It's very difficult to sustain that level of consumer interest or concern uh, for longer than sort of three or four years uh, at a time. I think consumers are crucial to all of this, but they're generally not the primary driver. And I think one of the m more important drivers these days is is business to business pressure, the way in which um, for example, some of the big market gatekeepers, some of the retail chain supermarkets and so on, Marks and Spencers in, in the UK, Walmart in the uh, US, uh, similar groups elsewhere, have started to rattle their supply chain and, and, and cascade uh, uh, new demands. And a lot of that's around energy efficiency. A lot of it's around the uh, areas that, that potentially save uh, money. And a, a, a number of these supermarkets uh, are, are less uh, energetic when it comes it comes to social issues uh, or whatever. But um, I, I, I just had somebody in the office earlier on today uh, from Denmark, uh, from uh, a wind energy company called Vestas, and what they've been trying to do, and I think you know of the uh, initiative, the, the WindMade uh, uh, labeling scheme, is mm. to link to consumer decision points the question of what was what sort of form of energy was used to make the product that you're about to buy and this is a labeling scheme which would enable people not just to see the proportion of wind energy that goes into a product but renewable energy of any uh, sort now i think that's going to be a tough sell in many countries for quite some period of time but nonetheless i think that sort of an initiative is brave uh, and 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 well worth supporting well, i think conscious consumers are really paying attention to all components of, of production, whether it's the country of origin, the method, the labor, as well as the materials or ingredients to make the product. And I think that more people that really hone in on those particular issues will embrace it. But as well, you said, you know, we'll see how that goes. I, I, two, two things. One is I, 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 I think... Conscious consumers are, are, are a reality, but at a relatively low uh, level in most societies uh, still. And they tend to be fairly particular in, in the sorts of issues that they pick up on. So they may be interested in health issues or they may, may be interested in animal welfare issues or climate change uh, concerns, but, but in a sense not generically interested and uh, rarely interested in sort of systemic uh, change and then you ask the question, which I didn't properly address, around uh, clean technology. It's a field that I've been involved in for decades. I've seen it go screaming upwards and screaming downwards, and I think, you know, this is the future. Uh, but it's really complex to get some of these uh, new technologies out of the laboratory and into the uh, marketplace at scale. Um, as people are very nervous about the Chinese in areas like solar photovoltaics at the moment. But at some level, we have to welcome the way in which the Chinese are now driving down the cost uh, of uh, photovoltaic cells, even if the impact on our own manufacturing companies at the moment it can be quite devastating. Now, in regards to the folks that you mentioned on the zero-not rule of honor, um, I 
would like for you to talk just for a moment about Ray Anderson. Yeah. Uh, what do you admire the most about him? Well, I knew Ray moderately well over a fairly extended time scale. We'd often end up speaking at similar conferences in different parts of the world. I, he's somebody who, the more you knew him, and this isn't by any means the case with CEOs, the m- m- more you knew him, the better you liked him. And you liked him for a number of different reasons. On, 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 on anyone who uh, has seen him speaking on television or, or, or met him face to face, will will have, will, will have uh, recognized immediately. He was an immensely charming uh, 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 man. Uh, but at the same time, he was deeply, he had a deep sense of um, responsibility. And I think when he read uh, Paul Hawkins' book, The Ecology of Commerce, and had this sort of spear in the chest moment where everything for him changed, mm. um, I think that spoke to somebody who had um, a deep sense of, of, of responsibility well beyond the typical boundaries that are driven or, uh, drawn around uh, companies. I think he was courageous. I think he, he tried to do things that he didn't always know uh, uh, how to do. And I think he was honest. And I think one of the things uh, that most struck me about him was that when things didn't go the way he expected, um, uh, and he had a big problem around um, trying to hand over to a new generation of management inside Interface, he would talk about that, uh, not unkindly, but, but to try and help the wider world understand the challenges that, that someone like him um, addressed. And so for, for many different reasons, I, I, I think he was an extraordinary uh, leader. I think the one thing we, we should feel grateful for now is that in those days, you'd point to a few people, Ben and Jerry, you'd point to Anita Roddick at the body shop, and um, you know, companies like Patagonia. But it was a very, very small group of people. It's, it's a significantly larger group. And so, the, unfortunately, we, we sort of regret uh, Ray's passing. But, but I think he's also passed the bat on, on to a, a new generation of uh, leaders. Without a doubt. I would like to just take a moment to ask you, if you would, to talk about the organization that you work for now, for Volon. Well, I've I've, um, uh, I've co-founded three companies. Luckily, they're all still alive and on their feet and the rest of it. And the first one was in 1978, and that was uh, environmental data services. And we were basically trying to break open the world of business to get companies to talk about safety, health, and environment at a time when they really didn't want to do that. The second company was sustainability. That was 1987. And that was around issues like the triple bottom line. And then Volans was, was, was an attempt to create a space in which we could take higher risks, where we could start to work with disruptive uh, innovators who quite often didn't know how they were going to uh, pay us. I mean, we, we cross we, we cross subsidize different parts of the business. We work for big companies, and that enables us to work with uh, much smaller ones. But um, still work in progress. We're four and a half years old, and I'm enjoying it immensely so far. I think all the work that you've been doing is just absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to join us. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and also sharing some of the knowledge that you've gained throughout all these years working with all these wonderful people and really helping everybody to make the changes that we truly need. If I may just also say, I mean, I I think Clean Energy View is is a great idea, and I wish you every success with that, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to your audience. Thank you so much. And if you wouldn't mind, could you also give our audience your website so that they can connect with you there as well? Yes, there, there, there are perhaps three that I would give. One is um, uh, uh, Valance, V-O-L-A-N-S, dot com. The second is uh, Zeronauts, dot com. And the third is John Elkington, dot com. And in different ways, they may be able to help people understand uh, elements of what we do. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John. I, Thank you, Louise. We don't have enough time, but uh, I would have loved to have asked you some more questions, which maybe we can do at another occasion. I'd love for that to happen. Yeah. Thanks, Louise. Thank you. Folks, we are out of time. Thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Clean Energy View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone.